Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we submit ourselves wholly to your purpose and your will, and I pray that you would increase our faith, cause us to have a great hope of our calling, and establish our feet on solid ground, Lord. Give us strength and give us the love that and the fortitude that passes understanding and the joy that uh, uh, accompanies it. And pray, Lord, tonight that your word would be clear. Pray that you would probe the very depths of our hearts and grant us insight into your purposes for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing in Hebrews, starting with Hebrews 11. Okay. <clears throat> Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. I remember, uh, I think it was Reese Howells, his uh, tombstone says, faith is substance. And I like the idea that faith is just not simply a belief. It has content. It, it, uh, it's something that's present. It's tangible. It's tangible spiritually, but nonetheless, it's not ethereal and removed and hard to understand and it's a it's a representation it's the substance of things hoped for and we've said before that one of the mechanisms of growth in the Christian life is to add hope to the faith that you have and then that in turn invites the love of God to be completed in us so faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest, of course, is charity. It's the evidence of things not seen. And it really is evidence. The faith enables you to see what the natural man, it's impossible for the natural man. And increase our faith is, is the prayer to pray. And with that, we start to see that events in our life are actually coordinated. I think we have too great of a inclination that, uh, that our world is just simply one of cause and effect. And I say things and do things and there's a ripple uh, reaction from that. But I don't think that's as sound as it could be. What is more sound is that the Lord himself is present in all things. And he moves all things according to his pleasure. And faith helps you to have sight so that you can see that events come from his hand. And it helps uh, to realize how you're being guided when you recognize that certain events are by his design rather than Look what they're doing to me, or maybe this happens by chance. For by it, elders obtained a good report. And so Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. So we're going to review the, the grand uh, grandfathers and grandmothers of the faith. And so eldership, it takes faith for eldership to be effective. And there's a certain gifting in all of the gifts that takes faith. And it takes, on your part and my part, it takes faith when we're being exposed to gifting or exposed, in this case, to leadership. And recognizing that the Lord himself is causing things to move forward. And I think if if we're not aware of that, we tend to move on our own accord. Uh, we tend to, it's kind of a blindness where we just kind of push forward, living by our own wits. And, uh, and what happens, that subtracts from our ability to do the will of God because we're just not, we're not connected to the reality of what's happening. And so uh, it takes faith for the good report and, uh, and that, that in itself gives a kind of a profit an advantage to, in this case, to eldership. 
Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Of course, science has its own view. I chuckle every time they come up with a new theory of the Big Bang. The problem with the Big Bang is that we know proportionately all the elements that exist, like how much potassium and so forth. And so when you model the Big Bang and everything explo explodes, if your model is correct, then all of these elements will be in the correct order and the correct amount, and they never are. So, uh, so they're, uh, they don't act like they're struggling, but they, they really are. Uh, so the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. And so uh, what a marvel it is when we discovered molecules and atoms and electrons and it seems like it just keeps on going quarks and so, uh, I wonder if there's an end to it it'd just be like the Lord to have the physical creation infinitely deep ready to be discovered by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain and so remember Abel sacrificed an animal and Cain who was a vegetable type offering and the scholars are miffed how, you know, why was the Lord so angry with the one and so pleased with the other? And the answer is faith. Faith is like a, a, a lamp. Faith enables you to see, it's a spiritual lamp that enables you to see things that are spiritual. And my take is that things that are spiritual are more real than the things in our natural world. Uh, when this natural world is done, the Bible says, the Lord's going to close it all up like you fold up a garment. That, that's how substantial it is. You know, it's, whoops, 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 we're done. But uh, the realm in which there is life in the spirit, that's, that's more real than we know. And of course, that's the realm that we will experience when we pass on and as, uh, as eternity unfolds for us. So he obtained a witness that he was righteous. And uh, of course... Cain couldn't stand it, so religious jealousy is an incredible, hateful <laughs> disease, and uh, I think we're subject to it. There's evidence that we are subject to it when we find ourselves critical of those who don't believe as, as we do. The... Uh, the Bible says, what do you have that you didn't receive? And if you received it, why do you glory as though you didn't receive it? You know, like, I figured this out. No, you didn't. So if you know more than someone else, rather than criticize, if you criticize them, you're actually criticizing God and confronting him. It's an affront because uh, he gave you something he didn't give someone else. And then you attack that person whom God didn't give something to. And, and we have this, and I think it's demonic, we have this tendency, therefore, to disparage them. You know, what do they know? And there they go again. Whereas it's like a sixth grader despising a third grader because he doesn't know what the sixth grader knows. And so so go easy on that. And, and another reason, just from my own personal testimony, is over the past maybe five years, maybe a little longer, I've detected, I think, that the Lord is moving to join the fragmented parts of the body of Christ to join them together. And so what's necessary for you then is to be open. That doesn't mean you compromise. That's not the point. But you allow yourself companionship even though there are these uh, sharp differences. God testifying of his gifts and by it being dead yet speaks. And so uh, the structure of faith is elusive. We begin, it's an assurance, the Bible says, and we join our faith with belief and 
I suppose that can strengthen faith, but faith is actually more like a, a, a lamp. It's more like a spotlight. It, it shines on things that ordinarily cannot be understood, and it brings things forward to you. And so what normally might happen in the natural gets reversed when faith is present. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and so uh, I guess Enoch and Elijah are, are uh, two that we know of that didn't pass death, but it's kind of interesting because that means they're, they're in their bodies in heaven unless they, they had a transformation. We have no idea, so that's something waiting for us to discover. And was not found because God had translated him him and before his translation he had the testimony that he pleased God and something I've been thinking about recently and I've shared this before all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and that's where we stop and it's what causes division you have to continue and engage in the next three it's profitable, it's pro it, given by the inspiration of God and the, uh, the doctrine is followed by reproof, which is where the Lord himself tags you and says, no, no, I don't like that. And then correction is where he manages your life and uh, makes something that was uh, malformed and you know, you know, it's like a doctor having to crack the bone in order to put it back together again. And then instruction in righteousness. There is a great deal of information that's beyond doctrine. It's, it's teaching. It's, uh, this is the way walk you in it. And it's more instinctive. It's something that's planted in you. It's, it's uh, supernatural. And Enoch had the testimony that he pleased God. So, and instead of Jesus, and I've said this before too, Jesus said, I always do the things that please the Father. And I think one of our lacks is that we're not aware when we displease God. And so that's um, a black hole that we need to transition through that so that we're much more sensitive to our, our behavior and, and whether it is matched with God's approval or not. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Uh, it's the uh, it's the foundation for he that comes to God two things he he must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him so the the influence that this brings to you is the necessity of diligence you can't coast from day to day and be corrected by various nudges you have to press uh, you have to be devoted to growth. You have to be devoted to the purposes of God. And one of the things that are learned, and it's learned by revelation, is that if you press diligently, that you'll be rewarded. So it's not, oh no, here I go, and this is such a bore. And, but rather your pressing in to the depths of the Lord is something that delights him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, he built the boat and how long did it take before it started raining? Was it 40 days? Or it was quite some time. And he was moved with fear. He knew trouble was coming. He preached uh, for a long period of time and not one convert. But he prepared the ark for the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. The testimony that the scriptures has of Noah is that he was righteous and that he was perfect. He's one of the few in the Bible where that is the uh, testimony. Abraham, on the other hand, God said to him, be perfect. So it's... Uh, how about asking the Lord for an evaluation? Where am I between uh, Noah and Abraham? Where am I sub-Abraham? It's a good idea to 
have from the Lord a mechanism by which it, that you're motivated and not discouraged, but you're able to see, uh, I have somewhat against you. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And we spoke of obedience last time. Uh, we are much too lax. And we pass over verses that command us to certain actions and it doesn't move us. And so we don't participate in that at all. But he went out not knowing where he was going. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's most of us. Uh, you know where you're going? Or, you know, how about letting me know? Maybe, maybe we'll travel together. By faith he sojourned, and a sojourning is temporarily staying in a place, in the land of promise. That's the very place he was, uh, that he's going to inherit. But he was a stranger there, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And so, in a way, that's a picture of our life here on earth. We, uh, we are temporarily engaged in things that are malformed and it takes faith but eventually the meek will inherit the earth for he looked for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is god and we're we're commanded to pay attention to how we are strengthening our faith what is it we are doing that allows uh, that allows us to have the rock bottom foundation the part of the very structure of our growth so that as we obey his uh, commandment or his observation remember I think it's Isaiah 66 um, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool where is my house that you built me where is the place of my rest and so that building cannot be done properly without the foundation Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength. Now, that's unusual. You, you would think God said would say that she was made young again. or uh, But she, what she lacked was strength. And she was given strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. What a remarkable thing. And she had the faith even though she snickered when the Lord was talking to Abraham you're going to have a child and so she laughed and uh the lord remember the lord challenged her on it and uh, she, he says you laughed and she says no i didn't he says yeah you did so, and why because she judged him faithful who was who had promised so sometimes we do silly things i don't know it's our it's the shallowness of our flesh which has not much substance but sometimes it can create a ruckus uh like sarah did but at the at the heart of it what really counted was that she had the child because she judged him faithful therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead so many as the stars of the sky and multitude and the sandwiches by the sea sure innumerable and so that is a marvel because there are a lot of sand particles in the sea and there are a lot of stars and they keep they keep discovering thousands and millions and billions of them as their telescopes are able to uh, probe more deeply and so that's that's his inheritance and so there's a link between Abraham uh, and, and through the progeny that brings forth the Messiah, and out of that will, are an innumerable host. Remember on Mount Zion, there was, they were clothed in uh, white raiment, and they had palm trees, and it said it was a number that no one could count. That's a pretty big number. These all died in faith, and so that's one distinction between then and what we have now. Uh, they died in faith. They didn't receive the promises, but they saw them afar off, and they were persuaded of them and embraced them 
and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And we too should share that same pedigree. Uh, seeing them afar off, being persuaded of them, embracing it and confessing, you know, all of this is temporary. But when all is done, we will receive the inheritance of all these promises. Not one will be overlooked. For they say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had an opportunity to have returned. And so that's a dreadful warning. Be careful when you look back over your shoulder and maybe with a wistful, uh, boy, those were good days there. Boy, I, I wouldn't mind uh, experiencing that again. There's treacherousness in that. We have to keep looking forward and forget, forgetting the things that are behind, the Bible says. And so um, this indicates that if you're looking too much backward, it can actually be an occasion to capture you and to drag you back. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly, whereof God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. I don't think we characterize the Lord well enough that he has I don't think my I don't think my term is that accurate, but he has emotion. He feels, he thinks, he he reacts, and things grieve him, and so he can react to some through shame, and so in this case, uh, because our heart is seeking something that's heavenly and something that is better, then he has no shame at all. Uh, And he's, he's pleased to be able to say, I am your God, for he has prepared for them a city. They're, I think we castigate too much, oh, how is it termed, uh, people who have heaven as their goal. Uh, we disparage that. Go, go easy. <laughs> you have a verse like this. There's some heavenly things that are going on up there, and some have been up there for thousands of years, and so... Uh, I ask people who are tempted to do that, are you going to go to heaven when you die? And they kind of stop. It's like they never thought of it. They just, uh, they just know that there's a new heaven and new earth. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, remember, offer up your son. He offered up Isaac, and he that received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Of course, the Lord stayed his hand of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And the inference there is uh, Ishmael. Uh, it's the wrong, wrong direction. It's not going to be profitable. And Abraham accounted that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. And so that's the extent of his faith. That's pretty, <laughs> it's, uh, that's a pretty remarkable frame of mind. Uh, what would we do if, I don't think the Lord will ever ask us, but what would we do if we were in that place? It's, um, it, but it's faith that enabled him to take the steps. And of course, that faith rescued him. God stayed his hand and rescued him from having to carry it out because God saw him. I can see. I can see. From whence he also received him in a, in a figure. In a, it's an allegory. So... Isaac was spared, and that's a picture of the seed of, of Abraham. It's the seed that is also demonstrated in, in Jesus, that those that die in Jesus Christ are also received. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. I, I like that because worship is physical. Worship is not an attitude of the mind or heart. Uh, worship, if you look in the scriptures, worship is demonstrated by posture, kneeling, face down, uh, in this case, 
uh, leaning on, on a staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. He didn't want to stay, even though he's dead. He doesn't want to stay there. Just bring me back to the land. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months. That took incredible faith of the parents to, to take steps to see that he was rescued uh, because they saw he was a proper child. That's an interesting phrase. Evidently, you can look at infants and see there's a grace there. There's something present that says, we need, to, we need to do something that is special. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Don't be afraid of the king's commandment today. There's, I know there's outrageous things going on. There's unbelievable things, things that defy possibility. It could not have been possible 15 years ago, but it is. But don't be afraid of it. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, he, years he, was, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And so he realized his calling and he renounced um, his sonship, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And we're called to the same. We need to join with others that do well and others that are not doing well and to... Uh, to accept the uh, a posture that their affliction also belongs to us. There's a, a kind of a kinship. There's a, uh, a desire to be part of someone else's affliction. And, uh, and of course, you take a hit when that happens. And that's the opposite of enjoying the pleasures of sin for a while. Esteeming at the reproach of Christ, there it is, you know, reproof, correction, Esteeming at the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. <laughs> so it's a good deal to hear the Lord say, I don't think so. Uh, can we, would you rethink this? Uh, your direction is not sound. You got to change. You have to turn around and head another way. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And so that means he paid attention, uh, knowing that if he pressed issues that were to his own satisfaction that um, he, he would not receive the reward, but he respected the fact that there was a recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, uh, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. There is a um, a major dimension of the Christian life, which const it's constituted by the ability to see the invisible. Logic will not bring it to you, thinking it out. Your experiences will not add up and give you an advantage. But there are things that can be seen. They're invisible and they are actually more real than what is visible. And so we need instruction so that our behavior, we learn how to adjust our behavior so that what is produced in us is the ability to see things that are invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And so um, the Christian faith is a rescue operation. By faith they pass through the Red Sea as by dry land. I, I want to see a video of that because evidently the seabed that they walked on, I'm guessing it wasn't squishy, so something happened. It was, and they have this wall of water up on either side that it said it was uh, managed by, what was it, an east wind? Uh, so how come the wind was strong enough to lift up the water uh, but not to blow people around? So that's on my list. Which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. They, they were so angry they didn't even notice. They, they just ran headlong in that way and it was to their destruction. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. And, and that warfare was accomplished by following God's instructions. So sometimes we get a little porky. You know, I rebuke you and 
you know, we, we press ourselves forward as though we have the cunning that's necessary. Uh, but the real cunning that's necessary is to follow the Lord's instructions. By faith the harlot Rahab perished, not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And I had a theory for a while that Rahab married one of the spies, but I don't remember how I did it, but I worked through the genealogy and it didn't happen. But that's a pretty romantic thing, isn't it? She rescues them and then, anyway. What shall I more say? The time would fail me. There's just too much to talk about. Let me ask you, and John ends by saying that there's so much about Jesus that wasn't written that if you wrote them all down, there are not enough books to contain it. What do you think about that? I think that's an exaggeration. I personally don't think so. And just look at the incredible number of books that have already been written and uh, one of the characteristics that, that I see is that no two are identical. For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jetha and David also and Samuel and of the prophets. It's just a long line of succession of uh, the heroes of the faith. And what did they do? Through faith subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness, obtained promises, they stopped the mouths of lions. So this this probably is the most most understood dimension of faith, just being mighty and doing mighty exploits. But there's a turn coming up. They quench the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. They turned to flight the enemies of the aliens. Say, that's... A, that's the kind of faith that assaults heaven and you know, storms the gates, gates of heaven. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. This is the turn. Faith is demonstrated by a long history of success and success and success. But now what's being suggested is that there's a faith that says, you know, I can wait. I don't have to be delivered. They didn't accept deliverance. It, it's a kind of faith that says, it's okay. Lord, it's okay. I, yeah, I see what happens. And I suppose I could put two and get others to pray for me and experience the same thing as Jephthah and all the rest. But they decide not to. They do not accept deliverance. And why? that they may accept a better resurrection. There are two resurrections. One is better than the other. And so the life that leads to the first resurrection has, a, has peculiar dimensions to it. And it's not, it's not recognizable. See, that sentence, others were tortured not accepting deliverance, doesn't fit what we just read to the tremendous... Uh, testimony of those that had faith and so sometimes in the Christian life there there are times where you have to turn from what is standard what seems historic what what even the scripture supports and of course that's risky business but it's a necessary mechanism in studying and living a life of faith especially if you have a, a burden to press on. And others had a trial of cruel mockings, scourgings, yes, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. So they, they didn't stop the mouths of lions. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder. That means, that means sawed in half. The uh, scholastic take on that is that that was uh, Isaiah. It's reported that Isaiah was sawn in two. We're tempted, we're slain with the sword, and wander about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted. This is faith, <laughs> tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. See there. Where's faith? Where'd it go? Well, it's another dimension. And it's a more difficult dimension. And it's easy to give up and say, 
I'm just going to coast. But if you're called in, in matters like this, then one thing that happens is that your heart sings. When the difficulty comes that's dreadful, it doesn't appear to you as dreadful. Remember Paul said, I take pleasure in affirmity. So you can't put that on. You, it's not a mental process, but uh, the joy that, it, that comes to us when we are going through a more difficult time is a characteristic of those that are called to this. And these all having a good report through faith received not the promise. Isn't that something? <laughs> they all went through all of this mechanism and it didn't, uh, it didn't move uh, the clock at all. God having provided some better thing for us. And so we are part of the equation that we learn in scriptures. They are like a preamble. They set the stage. They set an example. But they without us cannot be made perfect, is, which is the next phrase. They without us should not be made perfect. And so we, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that it's kind of like um, in a sporting event where we're being exercised in the game of life and the crowd is cheering us on. And when we do well, they say yes. And when, when we don't, they grow, they grow quiet. Yeah, they go, oh no, you know, look what they're doing. So, but they, without us, it, we're, we're a team. They played their part. And some of them were called to something somewhat dreadful. We must play our part and recognize sometimes... I don't know, it's almost like the Christian life has features of success. You know, this is true, this is true, this is true, and then that becomes our measure. And then through the process of life, they actually don't happen. It gets unraveled. Things that should have been well made become fragmented. And it, if, if possible, it creates a kind of despair. But take heart, set the despair aside, and say, Lord, you account me worthy of this enormous, it's not fair, it's an enormous difficulty for me, but you are counting me worthy because I'm going through it. And so I say yes. And then what will happen, the measure at which you took the hit, so to speak, with anguish and sorrow and misgivings and disappointments, the, the measure to which all of that occurred to you then gets multiplied in things in the spirit. Love, joy, peace, it just erupts to the opposite. And so uh, before Jesus' glorious resurrection, he died. And he was cruelly beaten. And so... It takes faith to take these mechanisms, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's the employment, sometimes neighbors, <laughs> sometimes other people in the church. Um, but, but take the time to present it to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm feeling this is my portion. Grant me grace. Grant me grace. I, I don't want to shirk off because I find it unpleasant. I don't want to shirk it off when indeed these are seed that is being sown that's going to inherit eternal life, that's going to blossom forth with great joy and majesty that isn't even close to compared to the anguish. You know, if you measure the anguish and then measure the joy that's as a result of the anguish, what is it, 10 to 1, 100 to 1, 1,000 to 1? It cannot be compared. Chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses and they're, they're cheering us on, I personally believe that the spiritual realm is a lot more real and a lot more active than we know. We, uh, we pretend that reality is everything. No, it's not. And uh, there are elbows uh, 
distance from us. I'll, I'll share something the Lord, I think it was the Lord you judge. Uh, I, was, I was newly saved and I went to a, um, a laundromat. So I had put my uh, laundry in, it was either washing or drying, I can't remember. And I had a book, and I think it was a, I think it was a Watchman Nee book. Uh, I was blessed by finding Watchman Nee very early. And this bum comes in, and there are all these empty chairs around the laundromat, and he sits down right next to me. Okay, he had on a brown shirt and brown trousers that matched, had a scruffy beard, but his eyes were a piercing blue. And he says to me, I don't mean to bother you. But I want to ask you, is that book spiritual? And so I had turned, I had tried to turn the book over so that he couldn't read the, uh, the title. But as I did, the, the, uh, the binder title it was upright. So it was like, ah, oh, you know, I can't, I can't get rid of this guy. And all along when he's talking to me, he has a bag, a paper bag. And he's reaching into it and he's pulling out bread. And he's breaking it and eating it. And so we, we interacted for a little bit. And he kept pausing and said, I don't mean to bother you. I don't mean to bother you. And then he got up and left. And I went out after him. I, you know, I, I, could, I knew this is unusual. And of course... He was nowhere to be found. So I think there's a great reality of what surrounds us and we can't see it except when it's the Lord's pleasure to let us see it. So a great cloud of witnesses. Because of that, lay aside every weight, every weight, every weight. Lay them aside, lay them down. Offer them up, some people say. And the sin that so easily besets us. And run the race run with patience the race that is set before us. It takes patience to find the best that there is in Christ Jesus, to find the great hope of your calling, to find the actual experience of the reward of great fruitfulness. There's a season where we're denied it, denied it, denied it, and sometimes it just seems like it's taking your whole life away. But you have to run this race with patience. And one of my favorite scriptures is, Let patience have our perfect work, that you may be perfect, entire, lacking nothing. That's, that's a pretty incredible testimony. Perfect, lacking nothing. Uh, I forgot it already. Let patience have our perfect work, that you may be perfect, entire, and lacking nothing. Patience alone will give that to you. So uh, add, add to your patience more than you had yesterday. Looking unto Jesus. That's a skill. And my personal belief is that is not accomplished in prayer. Prayer as petition or intercession or spiritual warfare is its own domain. Coming close to Jesus Christ is something else. And it takes some resignation it takes quieting yourself but it's not a trick you can't manipulate it you can't say well I did that and I don't know you can't do that because what you're doing is you're presenting yourself before the the great one the the majestic the the most honorable the most loving and it's at his good pleasure whether he responds to you or not. Call upon him while he is near. He's not always near. And so by presenting yourself before the Lord, you are demonstrating you're willing to wait. You're not in a rush. He's what's important to you. Look unto Jesus. He not only begins your faith, but he finishes it. And that word finish is related to tell us to be complete. To be perfect and so spend some time 
with the Lord, just the two of you. Remember Jesus said, go into the secret place, go in the closet. And he will finish your faith. Faith is not something that's over it, over, you know, just open-ended and keeps going on. Your faith has a place where it's done. Who for the joy that was set before him, so he gives the example. He saw the joy and he endured the cross, but he despised the shame. You know, he, didn't, uh, he wasn't loving it, but he endured the cross because he could see the joy as a goal. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't see a major testimony of joy in the members of the body of Christ. And if that's true, then that tells me that we're only part way along. Don't imagine your Christian life that you're nine tenths there. It's not likely at all. In some ways, you're just getting started. So there's there's a grandness that's waiting for you. But if your mindset is, you know, I'm doing pretty good, you know, just not quite there yet, uh, you're going to miss out on some of these experiences, which are a gift for you. Despite he endured the cross, despising the shame and is sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. That's... <laughs> ruling with Jesus is no small portion. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and fade in your minds. Jesus was walked a remarkable walk. I don't know if you've seen uh, the series The Chosen, some complain about it, that it normalizes Jesus too much and makes it ordinary. And there's things in there that aren't in the Bible. Uh, but I rewatched um, his engagement with the Samaritan woman just recently. And what the director has, I think it's a spiritual skill. Uh, when he met the woman of the adultery, he, he talks about several things that are really disconnected. And so he had the skill of creating a conversation so that each one was a natural consequence of the other that uh, convinced the, uh, the woman. You've not resisted under blood striving against sin. So <laughs> I hope I don't have to, but it's true. Uh, there is a place where you resist under blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children, my son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord or faint when you are be rebuked of him. And I think our Christian life, I think we craft it. I think it's an artificial mechanism that just shuts our ears. We, we can't hear his rebuke. And so it gives us a, a sense of safety, but it's naive. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He scourges, that's a weapon, scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. Don't run from it. Say, I needed that. <laughs> For what son is he whom the father doesn't chasten? But if you be without chastisement, where all are partakers, and if, if, you're, if you've been successful and avoided all that, then are you, and I substituted the uh, King James word, you're illegitimate. You're not the real deal at all. You're not a son. You're something else. Furthermore, we had fathers of our faith which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection under the Father and of spirits? And what's produced from that is life. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, the Lord, does it for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Is it worth a spanking to be holy? Maybe that's a good prayer to petition to the Lord. And say, Lord, I hear spanking uh, has a result of being part of your holiness, partaking of it, eating it, being developed by it. Uh, I'm a little nervous asking you, but I'd like to have some, if that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, it's a little uh, 
a little risky, but actually there's a great pleasure in being disciplined by the Lord because you're, you're set free. See, we don't realize how bound we are. And one way you can tell that you're bound is how are you doing with other people? What kind of relationships are you experiencing? That's a real clue right there. And so let him take steps that loosens your bonds so that you're able to partake of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. Of course not. It's grievous. But afterwards, and this is this is what you need to know. And if you if it's not part of your heart, make it part of your head to begin with. <laughs> Let it settle down into your heart. Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. That's the mechanism. There's no other way. Jesus bore a cross as an example. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down. You ever notice how easy it is to be sorry for yourself? Don't, don't let that overcome you. As soon as you sense it, just kick it in the shins. Lift up your hands and the feeble knees. And make strength paths for your feet. Lest he which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. So it takes courage to press into difficult, difficult things of the Lord. But where are you going to go? Are you going to look for pleasant pastures where there is no fruit to be born? Don't do it. Don't do it. Before you go to bed tonight, say, Lord, I am willing to be subjected to what we talked about tonight. I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm up for it. Follow peace with all men. Don't quarrel. Don't don't take people on. Follow peace with all men. Follow holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. I looked up um, a denomination, a Pentecostal denomination, that was formed in the early 1900s, and this verse was part of their station, uh, their statement of faith. They just put it right up there. Follow. Follow peace with all men, follow holiness, and if you don't do that, you won't see the Lord. And then I looked up their, station, their statement of faith recently, and it's gone. It's so one of the things I want, I want from the Lord, if, if it's his pleasure. I want to see a videotape of that committee meeting when they decided to get rid of it. What were they thinking? <laughs> Here's a, a dramatic scripture that we all, we all have to make, make a part of us, and they got rid of it because well, we have to be nice to people. You know, you can't you can't be too tough on them. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, and that's the grace of God is that portion that He brings to you to help you. And if you're dodging, if you're exercising yourself in things that the Lord has not called you to. You'll fail of the grace of God. I'll do no good. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trust you. And that's one of the things that life difficulties produces in you if you're not careful. Bitterness. Bitterness. What are they doing to me? Boy, I just hate this. Oh, man. And it troubles you. So notice that. Notice that what they do to you troubles you. Uh, someone used to say, if the enemy shoots you with an arrow, ask the Lord to remove it. He knows how to comfort when you're bent out of shape, as they used to say. And many thereby be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, for whom one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected and found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He was sorry he lost it, but he wasn't sorry he sold it. There's a difference between the two. I don't have it anymore. Oh, woe is me. Wait a minute. You, you sold it for, for a temporary condition? You were hungry? And of course... Uh, Jacob, I don't know, <laughs> he was a trickster. Isn't that what his name means? Trickster. 
For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched. That's, that's Mount Sinai. And that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they had heard, entreated that the words should be not spoken to them anymore. It's a terrifying thing to approach the mountain where God is thundering and lightning and, and flames. And um, when Moses came down, he invited Israel to go up. They, they wouldn't do it. They said, you, you go up for us. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so there's a very unusual kind of peril in the Christian life. And that's, that's being reflected here. And while we are younger in the Lord, we, we are kept from it. Just like you, uh, you protect a child. But as you grow, the threat of these things start to surround you. And it enables you with your perseverance and enables you to see clearly what the threat really is, what you need to fear and be careful of, and what is really a lie and not something that's directing you. It's not easy to do. It happened in Pilgrim's Progress. He's toward the end of his journey. He's almost there and there are two lions, one on either side, ready, ready to devour him. And if you haven't if you don't know how that ends, you got to read the you got to read the book, Pilgrim's Progress. It's a masterful allegory of the Christian life. And don't buy the King James version; buy the children's version. You'll love it. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, "I exceedingly fear and quake." So there's uh, garments rolled in blood. But there's a certain maturity that's required. He doesn't push you into these things uh, just based on whim. You're actually trained for it. You're actually brought to it. And so when you're exposed to, uh, I don't know, the, the, there's a tremendous darkness that we uh, have to trans transverse. Uh, St. John of the Cross called it the dark night of the soul. But you are coming to Mount Zion. That's where we're headed. And we need more teaching on Zion because it's a, it's a critical component to the Christian life. And under the city of God, under the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. There is so much activity round about. And there's a Jerusalem that's in heaven. And the odd thing about Jerusalem, according to uh, Galatians, is that it is our mother. Uh, find a place for that in the statement of faith. But it's, it's a process of bringing forth. It's a process of labor, of travail. And Jerusalem has that capacity to bring you forth. To the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn, that's us here on earth which are written in heaven we we have an anchor there we we are known our life is known in in the heavens and and we really are compassed about by witnesses and i think they are an arm's length away i don't think they're off you know barely visible the things of the lord are ever present and to god the judge of all and the spirits of just men made perfect we do not hunger for perfection. We need to. It is a common Bible topic. And what we do, we just skate around it because the enemy has convinced us it's not possible. So the blood of Jesus can't cleanse us from all sin. Is that what we're saying? So it's a, it's a lack of faith. And to Jesus, he's there too. And the mediator of the new covenant, he's standing in the midst of all this. And remember Romans 8, Jesus intercedes for us. He's praying for you. He's, he sees the dilemma and he's petitioning the Father. And so you're not alone. You, it, the pain looks like no one cares, uh, but that's not the case at all. 
and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. And so uh, there is a great mystery that is heavenward. And for me, these mysteries are meant to be known. Now, there may be a collection that we don't learn until we pass on or don't learn until eternity is well underway. I can see that. But I think generally, the mystery of the kingdom of God is something that needs to be brought to us and explained and understood. Because out of it, uh, the Lord will produce a great maturity. See that you don't refuse him that speaks. For if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. Go to the Lord with every angst. Go to the Lord with everything that's negative, every disappointment, every failure. It is in his hand. And so take it straight to him. Don't try to, I don't know, don't cry your way through it. That's, that's not the point. The point is take a, take a look at your own confidence. And if it's lacking, go to the Lord and say, Lord, I... I need to be confident in you. Look, look what they're doing. It's and it's not right. I mean, it's, <laughs> your evaluation is correct there, but it needs to be joined with the sense that God is present, and that He's an ever-present help in time of need. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now He has promised, saying, "Yet once more I will shake not the earth, but also heaven." There is great uproar coming. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken. It's just, it's just not a rattling. They're actually dismembered, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So, uh, there are things in you that can be moved when they're shaken. There are things in you that cannot be moved that are shaken. So God shakes you so that the movable things get moved. <laughs> that's that's their, their destiny. And then what you have left is the things that can't be moved. Wherefore are we receiving a kingdom which can't be moved? You can shake all you want. You can shake the kingdom all you want. Can't be moved. Let us have grace. We need grace is the process. It's a virtue. And it comes from the Lord. It comes from the throne. It gives you the capacity to take steps forward where you have a lack. It's the grace of God that fills that lock. If you lack courage, that grace will give you courage. If you lack uh, forgiveness, that grace will, will enable you to forgive. And so going to the throne of grace is majestic. You cannot forget it. Remember, we've mentioned this before. There are two things you get when you go to the throne of grace, and the other is mercy. And we need mercy because we miss it more than once. So mercy is where God says, it's okay, I got it. I got it. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. But you're coming to me for mercy. I'm going to show mercy. And I think sometimes we lack compassion as to whether the Lord is really merciful. You know, And our doctrine does that, you know. Your doctrine is different, so God's going to get you. Be, be careful of that. For our God is a consuming fire, which he is. But he's, it's the kind of fire of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's a, it's a fellowship. It's a time of fellowship. Chapter 13. Let brotherly love continue. And we've mentioned before the different levels of love. Loving your neighbor is first. Because if you can't love him who you see, you cannot love him who you cannot see. So it's love of the neighbor, love of brethren, love of your enemies, and then the love of God. Don't be forgetful to entertain strangers. See, that was, I think that was my experience. Uh, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. I, I can remember his eyes and his breaking of bread. Uh, just, I think back upon it and... I don't think the Lord has ever confirmed it one way or the other, but I, I'm persuaded in any case. 
remembering them that are in bonds. And so uh, there are believers in other countries. They are literally bound and, uh, and executed. And our heart is to be with them, bound with them. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. And so have compassion uh, uh, toward people who there's just, it's not like a natural phenomenon. You have something unusual that happens to you and then your response is unusual. You act it out. And so be, be merciful on the people that are acting out in a crazy way. Uh, because what's probably happening is that, that they are being afflicted with something that is crazy. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. All sin will, it'll all stand before the throne. And you have a choice, get rid of it now or get rid of it then. Getting rid of it now is the main thing. And what if you get rid of sin? What do you call that? Well, it might be perfection. Let your conversation, and that word always means behavior, let your behavior be, be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. See, one of the American dreams is to have more. Because he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So you're not, you're not coasting through this life alone. And I think one of the joys that will come to us, maybe it's after we pass on, where the Lord reveals to you how he was carefully leading you through every event in life, including the unpleasant. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man can do to me. So when you see the news with its outrage, I will not fear what man shall do to me. Remember them that have rule over you. Now, our in the modern church, our church structure is mostly without rule. And I think that has to change. We need, we need confidence in leadership so that if they, through their gifting, give us instruction, we're ready to receive it and honor it as though it has come from the Lord. And I don't remember back when it was in the, back in the 70s with the discipleship movement. It was just the opposite of this. They thought they were ful fulfilling it. What they were actually doing was controlling your life. And it failed within months. Remember that and them that have rule over you, who has spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Uh, Paul said, be you followers of me as I am of Christ. Considering the end of their behavior. So when you see godly behavior, something that is honest, something that has the presence of the Lord, the testimony of, of God's provision for you, that needs to be honored because that's there for you. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. <laughs> you know, what you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's still the same. Don't be carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Boy, do we do that. For it's a good thing that the heart be established, there it is, with grace, not with meats. And that means the rules and the different ways of parsing the Christian life and that bring shame if you don't do it. Don't get engaged in that. Which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. There's just no point to it. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serves the tabernacle. And so remember, that's, that's uh, David. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. It's, uh, the, there's a sacrifice that is present in the camp, but there is also a dismissal, a, a removal of things that are offensive and the Bible calls that being outside the camp. And so Lord take my behavior and that which is acceptable bring it into the sanctuary that which is not acceptable <laughs> cut it up and burn it up. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him 
outside the camp. Let's follow him in this process. Colossians indicates that the sufferings of Jesus are not complete. And we're called to participate. We're called to fellowship in his sufferings, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. When the Bible says pray without ceasing, that seems impossible. But it is, it's not only possible, it's required. And through that process, you learn, you have an inner life that is in the process of sanctif being sanctified. And you have an outer life which is being uh, marshaled, it's being uh, disciplined. But that inner life has the capacity of praying continually of always presenting itself before the throne of God. And so that's an exercise. You exercise yourself in this, and it takes some practice, and it takes some faith, and it takes perseverance. But to do good and communicate, don't forget, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Do good and be sure you have something to say. We limit what could be tremendous contributions from each one in the body of Christ. We have to learn how to do that because with children you get some foolish things and with fleshly you get some foolish things, you get fleshly things. And not everything, is, you know, some things are actually unclean. And so we, that's why we need the rule so that we have a, a proper dividing so that that which is wholesome is adhered to and that which is not is removed. Here it is again. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. It may be hard to believe that they care about what you're going through, but they have to give an account. See, you've been given to them, and the Lord goes to them and says, So, how are you doing with Freddie Smith, your know, brother Fred? Oh, uh, I yelled at him. <laughs> Uh, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You have to be trained in uh, how to lead others. That they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that's unprofitable. You don't give leadership a hard time. You create grief. and You will take the hit for that. That's what this says. Do it. Do it with joy. Pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this that I may be restored to you sooner. Well, I think uh, the, the writer of Hebrews, which there's a great conversation as to who it actually was, uh, was in prison. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead the, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. I read the whole thing because it is a whole thing. And when I marry <laughs> the couple, I end with this blessing. It's the very last thing I say. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Accept that blessing. I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. <laughs> Just allow it to sink in. Don't, don't push back. For I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know you, not, know you that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. So this is a hint that it's Paul. Uh, because Paul and Timothy were very close. Uh, Timothy was a pastor under Paul's uh, tutelage. So evidently, Timothy, who was imprisoned, was set free, with whom 
If he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute them that have rule over you. That's the third time this has been referred to. And all the saints, they of Italy salute you. So that is that Rome? Is that where Paul's in jail? It's a puzzle. Grace be with you all. Amen. So that's the the mighty book of Hebrews. There's there's no book like it, and it's worth reading. I don't know once every six months or so, uh, so that you there's so many there's so many very simple things in it, but then it kind of startles us with something that's deeper that we that we're disoriented. We what's it talking about? These marvelous heavenly things. So keep that uh, present. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the greatness of this specific word, Lord, and I pray that we might submit ourselves to its very content and help us receive the grace that's necessary to make the changes that the book of Hebrews calls us to and enable us to do it with great joy, giving you honor and glory. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.